Family is our primary home for experiencing intimacy. This is what we're supposed to learn in families, is how to be intimate. How do we be close? Okay. For learning the skills of intimacy and how to be vulnerable. These are important things is to get that we're teaching skills of intimacy. How do you talk with people? How do you, how do you behave? What do you do when people misbehave? Different types of things. Families teach that in that way. That's what they're supposed to teach in skills. So if you look at it, if addiction gets into the family system, then what it does is teach different types of things. Instead of teaching skills of intimacy, what happens is people start to learn skills of survival. Because with the danger that happens, it's a deadly illness, then the shift, one of the major shifts in addictive homes is instead of working to get close to each other, what I work to do is survive, maybe survive, you know, survive you and, and the way that you're being, survive the pain. So it's a major shift. That, so people from addictive homes lots of times have very, very good survival skills. Okay? But in terms of how to be close with other people, in terms of how to be that, there's lots of times that's where they feel lots of shame, they feel inadequate in that thing, and that's where they kind of distance themselves at that time. But boy, you know, you need somebody to go on a deserted island with you and survive, okay? You know, grab some addicts and have them come with you, okay? But in terms of that closeness, that would be another interesting, one of those survivor shows. Fill it with addicts and say, you know, you know. Get, this is a major part again. Addiction destroys intimacy. That's what it goes after. Vital to understand this. Vital to understand this. You know, that heart disease goes after the heart. Addiction goes after intimacy. It goes after our humanity. That's what, that's what intimacy is. It's the bringing of life to our humanity to be able to be with other humans in a human way, where we feed each other. In intimacy, I went, my definition of intimacy is it's something that's created. It, it's not something we fall into or we buy or any of that stuff. We have to create intimacy. And the way we create it is that we have to have a relationship and we operate in that relationship by principles. We act, if I can treat you respectfully, and you can treat me respectfully, if I can treat you with dignity, you can treat me with dignity, over time there's a byproduct of that. That byproduct is intimacy. So that's that type of thing of, of how do we create it. And again, addiction destroys that because it works to destroy connections. You know, I don't connect with you anymore, I connect with drugs. This is a, a interesting word in families. Families are based on the fact on vulnerability. We talked a lot about it again in the class this morning, and that very important thing. Vulnerability is the fact where I will be changed by you and you will be changed by me. Okay. And that type of stuff. So like when I decided to marry my wife, part of the agreement we were doing is to say, I'm willing to become a different person because of you, and you're willing to become a different person because of me. We will be vulnerable in that sense. We will be changed. Not, I will try and change you, you do all the changing, I'm going to stay the same. That type of, no, we have to both do that. And in families, what you are is changed all the time. You have to be vulnerable. And part of what happens in healthy families is people are taught that vulnerability is a good thing. I was vulnerable, you know, it was, and it, it turned out good. But in addictive homes, vulnerability is not a good thing. That if you look at it, part of the dilemma that we're in, um, we're talking about C.S. Lewis out there, and, and C.S. Lewis writes, writes a wonderful book about the screw tape letters, and he talks about that humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. So that type of thing, we're caught in that dilemma that we are animals, but we also are of the eternal, that type of stuff. And vulnerability is that part of allowing ourselves to move to the one that needed. So sometimes I might want to feel, I feel animalistic, but what I need to solve the problem is I need to principles. So what I need to do is open up to that. And that's a harder thing to do. 
And particularly in addictive homes, you learn that's not only not a good thing to do, that's actually stupid. Okay? If you look at it, animals do not expose themselves. You know, you don't see a bunch of deer standing out there here. You know, you don't see, you know, it does, you just don't expose yourself. It doesn't make sense. Okay? But if you look at it, if what you want closeness is, is what you do is you expose yourself to others. You ex not in the not in the way we're talking. What's that guy, Yogi? You said, Uncle. What's his name? You know, he, he got the flasher type thing. Not Uncle. What's his name? Fest. Not that type of exposure, but exposure of who I am. This is my struggles. This is the types of stuff. Those types of things. So, so to look at it, it's mutual vulnerability. I will become different because of you. It's a choice. This gets destroyed. Think of it when you, when you end up, you know, if your addiction took you to the streets, you don't do vulnerability. That's stupid. I'm going to be vulnerable? Get out of here, okay? No, uh-uh. That doesn't make any sense, you know. Uh, no, you change. I don't. We'll get into those types of things. It's a really wonderful concept, but you have to get, we do not like vulnerability. It's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. It's one of the things that I think that our field does, the chemical dependency and some treatment centers do beautifully as they teach people how to be vulnerable. If you look at it, what 12 step programs do, the 12 step meeting teaches people to be vulnerable. You go there and you see people being vulnerable. You know, this is, this is what my week was like. This is what it was like. You know, I made some mistakes this week. I did well. And you listen to it, and you just sit there, and you can choose your own time when to be vulnerable. Maybe you have a sponsor who's pushing you along a little bit. But vulnerability is a helpful thing. We need it. And where do we learn it once we've lost it? This is my mentor. This is my teacher, Damien McElrath. And he says, our journey through life is a community affair. Someone has to say, I will be there with you. And most often, that's what family is to do. Family is to say, I will be there with you. God. If you come from an addictive home, and they say, I will be there with you, you say, I don't want you with me, okay? <laughs> Go, you know, that type of stuff. So you learn not to. That type of stuff. So you, what you learn is to go it alone. Go it alone. I'll walk through life alone, thank you. I don't need you. People become a burden, those types of things. And that particular happens as the disease progresses. Because as it progresses, the things of humanity are the things that scare us. The things that, that people who care about us scare us, the different types of things. I use the example in a sense of you, if you're a 16-year-old kid, and let's say you're in a normal, healthy home and so on, and you go out for the evening and you come home around midnight and that, and your mom's sitting at the kitchen table, and she, you know, you walk in the door and she checks you to see if everything's okay, if all the body parts are there and that. You know, and the kid says, what are you doing, Mom? Says, I'm waiting up to see how you do. I want to see if you got home safe, all that type of stuff. You didn't have to do that. You know, ah, ham your mom. That's what moms do. You know, and they sit down and maybe talk, oh, how was your evening, what would you do, that type of stuff. That's called care. That's a caring, loving thing. The mother is just being caring and loving. Okay. What if you're an addict, a 16-year-old addict? You walk in the door, mom's sitting there looking at you, seeing if you're okay, because you've been out hurting yourself. You've been out getting high or doing what you do. You feel guilt. You feel shame. So, and particularly when somebody is there. So one of the things that happens in addictive home is care that types of stuff starts to feel like acid on your skin, so you have to neutralize it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Wait now. Well, I'm your mom. That's what we do. Oh, don't give me that mom crap, okay? You've never cared about me. You never did. You pick a fight, okay? Because you have to neutralize that type of thing. You have to get people away. It's a disease of isolation again, so those types of things. So that part, this phrase here, I will be with you, scares us. So it's like, no, I will be with myself. But we're not with ourself. We are not with ourself. We're with our illness. And that's the part to get. We have to, as human beings, make sense of stuff 
So what we do is we go inside, that's where we meet our illness or our addictive personality, and we run our thoughts through there. Why did you jump on your mom? Well, she doesn't need to know what I do. She's just a nosy mom anyways, that type of stuff. So you make sense of that type of stuff. You have to make sense of it. Why is it okay to push people away? You can't trust people, you, all that. So we come up with all the stories to justify it that justify us continually using. Because if not, if we don't, if you say, why did I push my mom away? It's because I have an illness that's killing me. Then you have to do something about it. So we always have to do the lying in that self, particularly to ourselves. This is important. This other is important because I want you to get, if you're a counselor, if you're going to work in this field, or if you're working with addicts, sometimes our job is to say, I will be there with you. That's what we do. That's the part that we do. That's what we say is, I will be there with you. I will help you in your struggles to be what you're supposed to be. This is part of what we're supposed to do, is find somebody who helps us answer these questions. Who am I? Am I lovable? Okay. What is my purpose? Those types. Of, and think of when addiction gets in there, what's the answer? Who am I? Um, <laughs> that's a better question for somebody else. I'll go to a counselor, they'll tell me who I am. Okay. Am I lovable? The answer is no. I'm secretly inside, you don't. No, I'm not lovable. What's my purpose? My purpose is to survive. That's my purpose is to survive. So that's the shift that takes place. Those are things that we have to challenge. And again, these are the things that I think family teaches. In normal, healthy families, these are the things they struggle with. They ask questions about that. Virginia Satir, she was a wonderful lady. She was kind of the mother of family therapy. Carl Whitaker was kind of the father. They lived in separate parts of the country, so <laughs> that type of stuff. But she talked about that it's family. In family, what we do is we experience the dilemma between me and we. Me and we. Do I err in terms of myself or do I err in terms of the we? That type of thing. And what she talked about is that me is an immature thing. We err in terms of being me when we're adolescents. Me, 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 me. Yeah, everything's about me. But what we're supposed to do is develop to see that the we is more important than the me. What's, those of you who are in 12-step programs, what's the first word of the 12 steps? We. Okay, So it pushes you into that we part. You start to learn that by ourselves we don't do well. It's a we. It is in the we. The strengths, we find our humanity in the we. We don't find the humanity by ourselves that way. So it's always in this part. 